Welcome to Stand, your community of everyday American heroes. I'm your host, Kelly Chewbacca, a former government watchdog and candidate for U.S. Senate in Alaska. I'm joined by my co-host and husband extraordinaire, Nikki Chewbacca, who formerly served as an employment law trial attorney in the Department of Justice's Civil Rights Division. We're broadcasting today from Alaska's last frontier, and we're here to equip and empower you to stand up to life's challenges one episode at a time. Hey, let's give a shout out to our community of standouts who help make this show possible. Subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast platform or on YouTube at The Stand Show. Tell your friends to follow us on social media at Kelly for Alaska. Make sure to share this episode with a friend. And this week we're giving out a free hydro flask sticker for Stand. If you want to be entered to win, make sure to leave a review on your favorite platform of choice and you could be that lucky audience member who gets a free sticker. Today, we are joined by an ordinary American who did an extraordinary thing by standing for our constitutional rights, Mark Janus. Mark was one of more than 5 million government workers whose First Amendment rights were being violated. And in the face of tremendous pressure and opposition, he took that fight all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and he won. So today we get to hear that story. It was one of the most significant Supreme Court decisions of our lifetime. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, glad to be here, Kelly. We're excited to have you with us. So let's start off with getting to know a little bit more about you. The battle you took on required a ton of courage. So tell us, where did your courage come from? Well, I would say for the most part, it came from my father and all my time in as a scout, uh, as a youth. I uh, became an Eagle Scout uh, where I learned a lot about perseverance. I learned a lot about courage. I learned a lot about public service. And then also my father, who, you know, told me that uh, at, uh, at during high school and even before that, he said, you know, if you can't do it right the first time, when are you going to have time to do it again? And it stayed with me the whole time, which is why I took on this fight, and why it came to the, the fulfillment of what we all hope will give uh, many, many public sector workers the freedom to make their own choice and ex exercise their First Amendment rights. Yeah, you really uh, hit on an important point there, Mark, that I really appreciate you, met, you emphasizing, which is this was one of the most important free speech cases of our generation, the Janus case that's named after you. Um, this was ultimately about free speech. It wasn't about anti-union. It was about freedom of speech. Uh, I want to just follow up on what Kelly just asked you and sort of dig a, dig a little deeper. The Bible tells us the story of a young shepherd boy named David, who many people are familiar with, whether they're uh, Christians or not. They, they know the story of King David of Israel. And we know that he slew this giant named Goliath with a sling and a stone. But before David was a giant slayer, he was a shepherd's boy tending to his father's flocks. And he talks about how he, he killed a lion and he killed a bear to protect his flocks. And that prepared him and equipped him for facing uh, the giant Goliath that he would later face. Circling back to your childhood, is there a specific story that comes to mind from whether it's your childhood or your young adult days when you had to take a bold stand with your metaphorical slingshot and a stone <laughs> to to take out a lion or a bear that you feel helped prepare you for that that battle before the Supreme Court? Well, I I would have to say it it again goes back to my scouting days. Uh, you know, learning to be out out in the wilderness fending for myself and having to complete a whole variety of tasks uh, in order to earn that, that highest rank. Uh, and it was during a time that scouts was, may not have been the in thing or the Vogue thing at the time. Uh, and people were always, uh, you know, detracting from it. Uh, even though it was very popular, uh, there were still the detractors and the idea that you can stay with it when you've got 
especially when you get into high school, you know, when you're starting to get into cars and uh, thinking down the road for college and you're also, you know, starting to date and, you know, become uh, familiar with your friends and making fast friendships that last your whole life. I would say that perseverance and that uh, continuation to, to get to that ultimate goal was probably the, the thing that led to uh, what I did and when I did it. Yeah, so Mark, Nikki and I are familiar with your story, but let's get our audience up to speed. Can you walk us through your career, where you started in your career, where were you, what was your job, when you filed your first lawsuit? How did this all start? Well, it, it all started um, back in uh, when I joined the state of Illinois as a child support specialist. And during the initial uh, HR intake, you know, you're you're signing all kinds of forms. Uh, you know, you're you begin to you know want to get into the job. You want to begin to learn the ropes and the like. And of course, naturally, you're also looking for that first paycheck. Mm -hmm. Well, that first paycheck had a line item deduction right along with all your taxes and pension and health care, et cetera. And it says that I was paying union dues. Well, that's what I thought was odd because I never signed a union pledge card. Hmm. Nobody ever said anything to me about joining the union. So why am I paying union dues? Uh, asked around to my peers and they said, oh yeah, you have to pay the union in order to work here for the state of Illinois. If you don't pay the union, you can't hold your job. Well, I thought originally that was ludicrous, uh, quite frankly. I mean, why do I have to pay somebody to have a job? That to me just doesn't make sense at all. Uh, but the, the uh, idea of uh, trying to do a good job you know, trying to do what I needed to do as a child support specialist, I kind of put that on the back burner and kind of forgot about it for a number of years. Well, why did, why did you have to pay a union to have your job, especially if you didn't sign anything? Well, because unions uh, a number of years ago went to the state legislature, uh, legislature, I'm sorry, and they said that uh, they set up a law that said, if you work for the uh, state of Illinois and you're under a government uh, collective bargaining unit uh, with your job title, you have to join the union, have to pay dues. Now, since I was not officially a full member and I was only a non-member, I had to pay approximately 80% of full membership dues, which quite frankly was not, there was only the difference of maybe about $6 every paycheck. Um, and therefore I was covered under that collective bargaining agreement. And therefore the union spoke on my behalf, even if I didn't want them to. And that was all because the state of Illinois passed a law in cahoots with the union, the public sector unions like AFSCME. So or to you, hold that job. you weren't part of the union, you weren't technically a union member, but they were representing you and bargaining for you, even if you didn't ask them to and didn't want them to. Correct. Yes, did, because did, you go ahead. I was covered under that job. Yeah, I was covered under that job title. You know, that. The, oh, that, I see. Uh, under the job. And, like and the job there were hundreds class. and hundreds of job titles within the state of Illinois that was uh, covered under a much larger collective bargaining uh, contract with the state of Illinois. Okay. And so then um, you, you've you learned this, you think it's, that's, by the way, not an insignificant amount of money that we're talking about. I oversaw personnel for the state of Alaska and all the bargaining agreements and taking that much money out of somebody's paycheck um, multiple times a year actually adds up to a significant amount of money by the end of the year. So mm -hmm. You go back to being a um, child support specialist, so you're you're working on getting kids the money that they need in order to live, and uh, go back to being a government civil servant employee for many years. Um, 
for, this goes on for over a decade. And the Illinois state government um, is taking your money and passing it along to AFSCME. Is that all correct? That is correct, yes. They basically treated me like an ATM machine. <laughs> uh, that's how I put it because, and the reason I say that is because the money kept coming out of my paycheck going to the union uh, and I didn't have any say in the matter. I had no choice and I had no voice. Did you have other people who, with whom you were interacting who were of, also covered under that collective bargaining agreement who felt like they had no choice either and, and struggled with that? At, at the time, no, uh, that wasn't discussed and, and it, uh, that information was not forthcoming. Uh, the, the, what I did learn, though, is after I filed the case and, and we eventually went to the Supreme Court, I found there was much greater support than what I had originally oh. thought. I thought, well, there's a few people here and there that might do it. But uh, in the end, there was a much greater percentage than what I had even uh, thought about or even That's considered. That's interesting. So this group of non-union employees who are forced to pay... Um, a large percentage of fees because of Illinois law. These are called agency fees or fair share fees. So let's pause our discussion with you there and we'll pick up after the break. We're with Mark Janice, who um, this story eventually becomes a U.S. Supreme Court case. And we want to hear how you went from being a government worker to a precedent setting U.S. Supreme Court case on the First Amendment after this. Thanks for taking a stand, Mark. Stand by. You're with Stand with Nikki and Kelly Chewbacca. Welcome back to Stand, where ordinary Americans can do extraordinary things, just like Mark Janice, who is with us today. Mark, we're hearing your story about how you became a government employee who took your work issue all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, we just heard about how you are not a union employee, but you were being forced to pay what we call uh, agency fees to the union that had the collective bargaining agreements for the government employees in Illinois. Um, one of the things that happened there is these uh, fair share fees or agency fees, they were often being used to support political activities and speech that really went against things that you believed. So one of the first questions we want to talk to you about is um, what did it feel like for you to be forced to pay for political activities of an organization you weren't a member of and for things that you didn't believe? Well, quite frankly, I was upset. I mean, here's my funds uh, taken out of my paycheck uh, and it's going to fund an organization that is setting policy, making policy, and uh, providing information uh, to its members that, quite frankly, I, I didn't agree with and that I wasn't, uh, uh, didn't want to be a part of. For example, endorsing political candidates for office at all levels, uh, from the city to the county uh, to the state and even on the national scene. Um, and trying to tell me that I had to vote in a particular way because that's the candidate they endorsed, uh, which I didn't agree with. Everybody has the right to a private ballot uh, when they walk into the voting booth. But here was the pressure from the union with political information being put on my desk at work or emails that were sent uh, to me or flyers that were put in my mailbox, you know, by uh, union members, and I, I just, quite frankly, felt violated in some, in, in a many different types of, of various uh, ways. It's interesting hearing your take on that. When I was running for U.S. Senate, there were so many times I encountered workers who would say, oh, yeah, you should know my union is supporting your opponent, but I don't know anybody in the workers who support your opponent. We're all voting for you. I'm sorry that our, our union leadership is supporting your opponent and our money is going that way, but don't worry about it. All of us are voting for you. So it's exactly like how you're describing. I think it's important 
to share that, you know, Nikki and I don't oppose unions. They serve an important role for workers' rights. My dad was a union employee his whole career. But also, as part of that, unions are supposed to protect and represent workers, and that includes protecting their constitutional rights. And First Amendment rights don't get surrendered simply because you accept a union job or a paycheck. So we should all be standing with every worker who wants to control how their paycheck is used. That's what workers are supposed to have protected, especially their paycheck. So as your story progresses in your situation, the governor of Illinois ends up suspending the collection of these agency fees, the thing that was coming out of your paycheck from non-union members, which applies to you directly. Um, when he did that, tell us what happens in your situation. Does the union just follow the executive order of the governor and stop collecting agency fees or start seeking consent from you in order to continue collecting agency fees? What practically happens when the governor makes that move? Well, what what he did is is he filed his own case against the union, but when it got into court, uh, the court said that he did not have standing because being a public official such as a governor, he was not having to pay any of these uh, fees, agency fees or otherwise. So the, the court felt that because he didn't have standing, that's where then my case uh, came to the forefront and the case that we filed at the at the federal level in Chicago, uh, at the circuit level, uh, was allowed to stand, if you will, and was allowed to continue because I was a union payer, even though I did not want to be, you know, a union member. Uh, so therefore, it was there was that um, idea that the court could continue to hear my case and how we continue to pursue it and continue to argue it. Mark, th let me ask you, following up on that, I, I have another question, but I think this is an important setup for the question I'm going to ask. How did they identify you, or how did hmm. you yourself get involved in this, uh, in this issue? Because it theoretically could have been anyone who shared your, your views and your concerns. So how did you get... Um, into this mix? Was it something that you sort of raised your hand and said, hey, uh, I volunteer me? Or were you approached? How did that all happen? Well, it was somewhat of a, com uh, how shall I say, a combination, if you will, uh, Nikki. What happened was um, I had an attorney friend of mine that knew I was very upset with the having to pay these union agency fees, hmm. even though I was not a member. Uh, he put me in contact with the folks at their Liberty Justice Center. Uh, they're a public interest law firm, and they fight for people's First Amendment rights. Uh, we began a conversation, a dialogue, and came to the uh, agreement that they would represent me uh, in filing a case against AFSCME. And, that's, and it's an acronym, but it's the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. And they are one of the largest public sector unions across the United States. Uh, we filed our case uh, and in the federal court in Chicago. Um, and, of course, we promptly lost, which was very disheartening. And, uh, and I thought, well, okay, this is over with. We then said no that or they told me it was good because then we could go on to the appellate level and we lost there also um, so I'm, now i'm getting really discouraged well then they said oh no this is good we're going to go to the supreme court and that's where i kind of had to sit down and take a deep breath because i said we're going to washington dc <laughs> and the united states supreme court with this case and they said oh yeah yeah and we think we have a good chance of winning Mm. Oh, that's 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 so cool. A, a lot of people, Mark, would have just let it go. Just to be <laughs> honest, they would have just said to themselves, "This this just isn't worth yeah. the risk or the fight. I don't want to risk my career. I don't want to uh, risk the disapproval and the conflict with my colleagues, you know, at work or other union uh, members." Better just keep my head down, collect my paycheck, suck it up, and you know, 
push through and then take my retirement on on the other end. Why why ultimately did you say, you know what? No, I'm going to take a stand here. Um, because even though this organization is immensely powerful and this could really cost me, I believe this is important enough that it's worth the risk. What was it that, that got you to that point? Was it just having an organization say, hey, we will represent you pro bono? Um, what led you to that ultimately? Well, I think a, a big part of it was what I saw within state government and the office that I was working. And I saw people that could not do their jobs, but they could never get fired, even though their supervisor had a stack of, of uh, information that if it was in the private sector, or American business, they would have been long gone. But the union comes in, they protect them, you know, and they stay in those jobs. Well, then I also saw other people, you know, that plain just were sloths and uh, yeah, they did the minimal amount of work, just enough to get by, but they really weren't doing the job to their utmost to what they were designed for. And then I saw lots of other things going on. And the bottom line was, is that if I was a taxpayer and I saw all this waste going on and I taxes are going to these people that aren't doing their jobs, I, I would be incensed. And of course, it's a common uh how shall I say, common knowledge that, that government is very wasteful. Um, and I think we all know that, but nobody really gets down to the bottom line as to how come it's wasteful. What happens with your tax dollars that when you pay your taxes, uh, where they go? And I think a, a really good uh, book that everybody should read is not accountable. And it's by uh, Phil Howard. Um, he documents immensely the waste of government and how government union contracts, uh, you know, are so in, in how shall I, I'm trying to search for a word here. Um, they go down to the minutia that a supervisor can't even, you know, do any kind of supervision of his workers because it would then go, may go against a contract. Um, mm. It might be kind of a long winded response to your question, but over all of those things is what got me, you know, my dander up and, and got the hackles on the back of my head and said, this has just got to stop. We, we cannot continue down this path. We just can't. Hmm. It sounds like if we were to sum up the story, you would say paychecks are worth protecting. Workers' paychecks are worth protecting. And uh, where your dollar goes this dollar, that $10, this $10, it actually makes a difference. We saw that recently with people's choices to stop supporting Bud Light, right? Everybody's micro choices actually had a macro consequence. And you came to that conclusion years before. If I take a stand for my micro paycheck, it actually represents a macro decision. And that's what you were seeing when you said, I don't want to support this behavior. I don't want to support these um, communications, I'm going to do something about it. And that motivated you to take a stand. Um, my dad would always say, hey, kid, if you think something needs to be done, stop pointing the finger. The person who probably needs to do it is you. <laughs> and <laughs> Mark kind of sounds like that's the conclusion you came to and you're challenging all of us to come to. We'll be back after this break with Mark Janice. Stand by. Welcome back to Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. You'll find us on YouTube at The Stand Show. Follow us on your favorite podcast channel. Mark Janis, thanks so much for being with us today. We've been talking about your fight for workers' rights all the way up to the Supreme Court. Nikki, you had a great question we were just talking about. Yeah, Mark, I wanted to ask you, even though you took a stand for workers' rights, I mean, that was what you were doing. You were taking a stand for workers' rights You've been wrongfully demeaned and even threatened as a union buster. The union that was supposed to protect and represent you turned against you simply because you were standing for the fundamental constitutional right to free speech. Can you share with us about that experience? What 
what happened and how did it affect you and your family, the, the backlash? Can you describe what, what happened and, and, and its impact on you guys? Well, uh, initially, I didn't tell anybody what I was doing. Uh, didn't even <laughs> tell my own mother. Um, because, you know, I didn't, number one, I didn't know what kind of backlash I would, I would receive, mm. if any. And I knew there probably would be. Uh, and not knowing the outcome of what was going to happen, uh, there's no point in making a big deal out of it, and, and then you get disappointed. But at the time that the uh, petition uh, went to the Supreme Court, and then they uh, accepted it and said they would hear the case, well, that was all over the news on a national basis. So it was a little hard to keep it quiet at that point. So that's when you know, the, the union really got on my case, uh, you know, with uh, news articles, uh, all kinds of op-ed pieces, et cetera, et cetera. And the people at work, um, it, that was surprising because even though they didn't overtly uh, come out, but I could tell by looks, I could tell by, you know, people that just, that I used to talk to all the time now just wouldn't even speak to me. I'd have people that I'd meet in the hallway and they'd kind of brush up against me, you know, like, eh, you bum, you know, type of thing. And, you know, so it was, you know, they, they thought I was, I was basically a pariah is what it boiled down to. And kind of an interesting uh, sidebar to that is that uh, I eventually did tell my mother I was going to the Supreme court. I was handling this case. And of course uh, she you know, ponder that for a second. And then she said, you know what, um, Mark, you know what they did to Jimmy Hoffa? Oh, <laughs> that's comforting. <laughs> you know, yeah. And I said, well, you know, thanks for the support. Uh, of course, my, my two children were very much in, in you know, support and, and said that, uh, you know, they supported me, of course, and the like, but they were somewhat concerned. Uh, but I, I kept their names totally quiet. Uh, and my whole family totally quiet uh, because, you know, obviously I didn't want anybody coming af after them and the like. Uh, so there was a time also uh, during this process when, uh, you know, I had a, a, a lady come to my house and she put a post-it note on my door in the middle of the night. It was like 2 or 3 a.m. Uh, and it said, I told you we knew where you lived. And of course, I we we know that it was a lady, and it was the time because I had installed some security cameras at the front door, the back door, and a security system. And we went back and replayed the tape, went to the authorities, and they said, "Well, we really can't do anything because uh, you didn't have any no trespassing signs up, uh, so you're kind of on your own in that regard." But that was mm -hmm. the only thing that happened then. Of course, there was a couple other instances after. The court decision came down in my favor that uh, you know things got a little more ugly uh, in that regard. How did it get more ugly? Well, after the decision, uh, I was in New Mexico, uh, you know, talking to people and trying to promote what's now known as Janus Rights, um, and I found out that there was a gentleman up in the state of Washington that had posted on Facebook that uh, he proposed that somebody ought to go out and try to kill me. Um, and he did not get any takers on it. So he posted again and said, well, I guess I'll have to do it myself. And after I do, I think I'm going to eat his brains, uh, because I bet you they taste good. Well, obviously this guy was, um, you know, not, uh, totally all there. So the FBI got involved and, and I've been, the, eventually the gentleman was arrested and so on, but he'd also made threats against, uh, uh, Trump at the time and, and other public officials. So it, he wasn't singling me out, but it was still very disturbing nonetheless. Of course. Oh, I'm sorry, Mark. I imagine that wasn't the only death threats you got. Um, no, there, well, if there were others, I'm not aware of them. Um, and, you know, but I, I think the the union knew that if anything did happen to me physically or otherwise, mm -hmm. um, quite frankly, would probably go against them in a big way, um, in, in a very negative way. So I think they kind of put the word out to, you know, lay off. 
mm -hmm. any kind of physical threats or other types of threats. Um, and they mainly did it through, you know, newspaper, media, uh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, can so, we follow up? I want to move to something a little bit more light. Yeah, that was the downside <laughs> was, of it. That was tough. Everyone um, knows taking a stand comes at a cost. Yeah, but... but they don't, they often don't see the cost or hear about the cost. They hear the, the sort of the heroic side of the story, right? The happy ending, so to speak, but they don't, they don't often hear what it took to get there. And that's mm -hmm. why it was important to ask those questions. And thank you, Mark, for being so, so open about it. Um, what was it like, uh, you know, when you got to the, to the Supreme Court? Tell, tell us a, a little bit about that. Well, when I when I actually got to the Supreme Court, um, you know, of course, there were when we walked in, there was lots of, you know, protesters and and others, uh, not a large amount, but but some. And um, quite frankly, it was just overwhelming. Um, you know, here I am walking into the Supreme Court building as a plaintiff in a, in a lawsuit and going into the courtroom, uh, which is packed um, because every time the court has oral, or oral arguments, uh, you know, lots of attorneys, lots of media and, and the like. Um, and here I was introduced to the governor of Illinois. I was introduced to Betsy DeVos, Secretary of Education hmm. um, and other notables. Uh, and quite frankly, it was just overwhelming. Uh, and, but when Justice Roberts called my case, uh, to hear your name called by the <laughs> Chief Justice uh, of the Supreme Court is, is just kind of blows your mind, if you will. Um, and then as the arguments proceeded, when you hear the arguments back and forth, and, and let me clarify something, a lot of people, four people. The Supreme Court, when they hear a case, it's more like a debate. It's not what you see on Law and Order or some of these other TV shows. Um, the, uh, you know, my attorney would get up and make some presentation. He would be interrupted, uh, you know, by a justice and asked a question. Um, he would then continue his remarks and and then maybe another justice would interrupt. And, and we go that way on both sides. Uh, they would interrupt the union side, they would interrupt my side, and it's it's a debate. It's back and forth and back and forth. Um, quite fascinating, really, but also very much a blur. That's the beauty of our republic at work. You know, ha there's, all, there's those two sides of the story, two positions on something, people in, a, in an orderly, uh, respectful way, debate the issues and the justices listen, ask probing questions, then they debate amongst themselves, they argue amongst themselves, and then they draft their opinions with their justifications for them. I mean, it's, for me, it's just a, it's a beautiful process when you see justice work out in that way, even if the outcomes aren't always what we might want them to be in a particular case. Um, yeah, there's dignity in process. Yeah. So, Mark, we know that you're not a lawyer, and there's a lot of debate about all this. However, you are pretty close to the case, and you've lived this out. What's your take on what the court decided in this 5-4 ruling? Well, I think what what they decided, and, and the, the main point, is that if you are a union member, you give up your First Amendment rights to that union and to that authority and the uh, administration or the officers of that union, and they speak on your behalf. If you are not a member of the union, you retain those First Amendment rights. You can speak for yourself, and you can make your own decisions, and that is the basic context of the case, that each individual employee, worker, whatever you want to call yourself, you have that right to make your own decision. However, once you become a member of a union, you lose that right. You give it up. And that's why in the decision that uh, Justice Alito wrote, he said, um, you must be given the 
ability to make that decision for yourself. And it has to be declarative. It has to be clear. Uh, mm. And you have to be informed of your rights. Now, now as an example, uh, we're all familiar with Miranda rights. Uh, I mean, if an individual is arrested, they are read their rights. Well, why is it when a new hire goes into a government office, why is it that they're not given the same rights, such as what's now I known as Janus rights? Why are they not given those rights? Just and like your many, point when you said, yeah. I didn't realize I ever gave that up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and so that is the, the only thing that is there. Mm -hmm. However, uh, unions don't don't like that idea. They don't let's, like the idea that you have a right to make your own decision. They want to make it for you. Let's pause there. Um, that's an important point to take up after this break. Make sure to subscribe to the Stan Show on YouTube or Stand with Nikki and Kelly on your favorite podcast platform. We are with Mark Janis, the gentleman who is an ordinary worker who took his case all the way up to the Supreme Court to fight for workers' rights. And we will be back right after this on Stand. Welcome back to Stand, where the Supreme Court is just another day in the journey. We're with Mark Janis, who took his fight all the way to the Supreme Court. We're hearing how his normal everyday work day turned into an epic day at the Supreme Court. Mark, you just told us about that story, but I want to pick up the conversation where we just left off. Interestingly, um, you were telling us your understanding of the Supreme Court case. You've been going around talking about Janus rights, and you were saying that um, every worker has an option to either join the union or not join the union. But if you join the union, you are yielding your First Amendment rights to the union. The union now gets to speak on your behalf. And the court said they basically need to be given notice of that when they take the job, almost like you're given Miranda rights. Those are now called your, quote, Janus rights. And you're having um, you're doing education around the country trying to implement that. I wanted to ask a little bit, how is that implementation going? How is the, I mean, this case came out like five years ago, right? And how is the um, catch going? We know, Nikki and I went to law school, sometimes the court um, does something like Brown versus Board of Education, the integration of schools, um, getting rid of segregation, but that doesn't mean it happens right away. So how's Janus rights going? Well, it's it's kind of a tough road, uh, Kelly, and and that's primarily because uh, the unions are doing everything they can to circumvent the decision. For example, uh, on the day of the decision in 2018, Governor Jerry Brown in California signed a new piece of law into effect that states that if an individual that's a member of the union goes to a supervisor and asks, well, can I get some more information about this Janus rights and you know what's it all about? The supervisor cannot talk to him about that under penalty of law, and the supervisor is to direct him to the union. Now, what could possibly go wrong with that idea or scenario? Uh, they're in, in the state of Illinois, for example, they passed a law that said that the union gets a mandatory meeting with every new hire at the beginning of the intake process. However, is the other side, uh, such as my side, if you will, be given the right to explain to people they do not have to join and they do not uh, you know, necessarily have to sign that union card? Mm -hmm. No, it's all one-sided. And there are other states besides Illinois that have done the same thing across the country. Um, and the unions have done everything they can to circumvent the process, even to the point of if you did want to try to resign uh, and get out of the union or what's now known as opt out, unions make it incredibly difficult. Um, they they put in all kinds of what's known as windows where you can only with uh, oh, withdraw yeah. from the union, you know, maybe for a particular two week period, uh, one month out of the year. So in essence, what you're doing is you're giving up your rights for 50 weeks out of the year um, and only being able to exercise those rights for two weeks out of the year. Mm -hmm. Now, let me, you know, 
uh, suggest that if somebody had that same right that's within the Constitution, let's say the Second Amendment or any other of the rights that we are offered, there would be a total uproar, unbelievable uproar, that you can only allow your rights to be exercised two weeks out of, a, out of an entire year. I mean, it's abominable. Right. Let's think of it that way. Well, it's interesting to hear your take because I remember when I served in the cabinet for the governor of Alaska, I was in charge of personnel and I was in charge of implementing the Janus decision. And so we were supposed to change our rules to require a um, directive that we got direct communication from the employees, like a card, uh, just like you're saying, where they said um, they wanted their union fees deducted from their paycheck. So they directed me and our HR department, yes, please deduct my union dues so that we didn't assume that they wanted their First Amendment rights violated. And immediately the unions filed lawsuits against us, putting a stay on that. And until it's resolved, the fees were continuing to be automatically deducted from the government and no notice was being given to our employees that their First Amendment rights were being um, ceded over to their unions and their paychecks were automatically being deducted for all their um, agency dues. Um, so I thought it was a little bit weird because as a government um, government authority, I'm sitting here at the paychecks coming out of my finance department before it ever hits my employees. I'm reaching in, pulling out dues, and then handing it to a third-party organization. I'm not taking out their PTA dues or their gym membership dues or their membership to anything else, their country club or anything else. We would think that that would be absurd, right? Uh, government doesn't act as your third-party dues collector managing your, your paycheck deductions for everything. Um, it, it, didn't, it just didn't seem logical to me. That, to me, if your union is doing its job of representing you well, um, serving its client base, just like any other organization, then it can manage collecting its dues from its client base, just like every other organization, right? It There was this huge fight that came up, just like they did with you. All of a sudden, I was a union buster because I was trying to implement the Janus decision, but it didn't make any sense to me. There's nothing union busting about it. Um, why are you getting government involved in a relationship between an employee and its organization that for all other purposes, government's required to stay out of. We're not allowed to communicate uh, with the employees about anything going on between, uh, anything that could be related between the union and the employees. Um, that That's a very protected relationship under labor rights law. I thought the whole thing was really interesting. Um, what was your response to criticisms about union busting? Because you've been dealing with this now for several years. How how do you address that when it seems like your intent as a government worker was to protect union rights? You deal with this with the Janus rights advocacy that you're doing now, but you were dealing with it even when you were an employee. For people who are listening who might want to take a stand on this issue, how would you equip them with responses to allegations or accusations that they're union busting? Well, I think it's a, uh, the idea that the union business model, if you want to, if, to use that analogy, uh, is so outdated and their usefulness in some areas has been put into federal and, and state and local statutes, such as how many hours in a work week. Uh, we have OSHA for company safety. Um, you know, we have health care that's been implemented and so on and so forth. These are all fights that have been won, you know, back in the 20s and the 30s and the like. But yet I find it very interesting that the union bulletin board at my work uh, uh, had a had a big poster that said it was the union that gave you the 40 hour work with and gave you health care and gave you this, this, this and this. Well, yeah, they did back in the 20s and 30s, but they're still trying to take credit for it um, and the like. And their business model has now turned more to politics and policy mm -hmm. and keeping their power, uh, keeping that ATM machine running, if you will, um, so that they can back the candidates to support them. 
For example, uh, out of every dollar that a union collects in dues, less than 20 cents of that dollar actually goes to wage and benefit negotiations. The balance of it, or close to 80 cents, uh, goes to some overhead and you know the administration of the union, but the majority of it goes to political purposes. Hmm. And it also can be used not necessarily on a dollar for dollar basis, but it can also be used as an in-kind basis. So let's say that you're running for office. You can have a whole bunch of union workers out there putting up signs, going door to door canvassing, et cetera, that uh, amount to other more than a millions of dollars in additional funds, if you want to put a dollar figure on it, um, it's over and above what they collect in dues. And if you also look at where this money goes, it's it's primarily, you know, to the progressive left. And it's primarily to an area that I believe a lot of uh, union members just don't ascribe to, but they're kind of caught, you know, between a rock and a hard place. Mm. That's a really good point. And we know that you're still in the fight. You're still fighting for workers' rights and taking on more Goliaths. Can you tell us what are you doing now and what can our audience do to support your work? Well, I would say the the, the best thing you can uh, uh, do to support my work is just be an informed citizen. Um, be aware that you have what's now known as Janus rights, that you can opt out of your union and not have to pay dues if that's a decision you want to make. It's totally up to you. Um, but the other part is, you know, uh, if you want to support, uh, we have Liberty Justice Center, uh, who is the, uh, the company that I now work for, the law firm, I should say. Um, you know, we're still fighting cases all across the United States, mm. trying to give workers their rights. We represented a, a, a young lady in uh, the Chicago area that was a came over from Barcelona, Spain, was going to teach school as a second or Spanish as a second language. She went through the usual intake. The union said, oh, yeah, in order to teach her, you got to become a member of the union. Well, she didn't know. She's from another country. Uh, but she did learn that she um, didn't have to pay. She went to the union and said, you know, I don't have to pay. I want to get out. I said, oh, no, no, that's all right. Yeah, we'll let you out, but you're still going to have to pay anyway. Mark, you let know, me pause you totally, there. Totally against the, the decision that the Supreme Court has said. Exactly. Those are the kind of cases Liberty Justice Institute's taking on. And we're so grateful to have you with us today, Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing with us about your fight. You can find us on at The Stand Show on YouTube. Make sure to share this episode with many people to get Mark Janice's story out there. And subscribe to our show, Stand with Kelly and Nikki Chewbacca. We're so grateful, Mark, that you took a stand for workers' rights and our First Amendment. Thank you so much for being with us today. And Standouts, we'll catch you next week on Stand.